Hello, this is your good friend Colette's. I am in an airport today. The Israelis have assassinated the political leader of Hamas, Ismail Haniya. And of course, this is cause for celebration among all the fascists. Because of course, another terrorist is dead. Am Yisrael Chai. Of course, it's a little bit more complicated than that. And I figured rather than simply shake sabers in this video, I would talk about the complicated life of, of this particular figure now that he's been so grossly murdered. Um, and just, you know, just so people know why he's important. Ismail Haniya was born in the 1960s in what is now the Gaza Strip, which was then occupied by Egypt, in a refugee camp. This is the source of a lot of his popularity. Compared to other political leadership in Palestine, he feels to many people like he comes from the people, particularly in Gaza, because so many of them grew up in these refugee camps and really, this is the reason for his continuous popularity, even despite some other controversies. His political career began, as, as many do, with peaceful activism. Of course, when you use peaceful protest against a fascist regime, what, what happens? You just go to jail. <laughs> You know, you go to jail. The first sentence he gets from peaceful protest is a very short one as a warning. But as he continues to protest, he suffers greater and greater periods of uh, detainment. However, in his detainment, he meets Mohammed Yassin, who is a more prominent member of Hamas, an Islamist group that was formed to combat the Israeli regime in the wake of the dissolution of the PLO and the uh, corruption and quizzling nature of Fatah. And this, this would be a, a, a resounding theme in the life of this, this figure, is that he would be in conflict with Fatah, an internal Palestinian uh, conflict, as well as with the Israeli regime itself. He participated as a leader in the first intifada and eventually was forced to flee and was eventually deported to Lebanon as well. However, he had engendered a greater reputation through his, let's say his sacrifices, heroism and his charisma. He was one of the few leaders in Palestinian politics that actually came from a very humble working class background. And that engendered a lot of respect from a lot of different people, unsurprisingly. People who he could relate to and could relate to him. But he also had the opportunity of having been prison mates with Mohammed Yassin, who was a very prominent figure. In the early two. <sighs> 2000s or the mid 2000s he was actually elected to head the government of Gaza um, over the Fatah party candidate this naturally upset both the Fatah Quislings and the Israeli regime and you know they, 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 for the supposedly only democracy in the Middle East, they could not really put up with any real democracy in Palestine. So they instituted sanctions. So they withheld $60 million in tax revenue that the Israeli government had collected supposedly on behalf of the Palestinian Authority and withheld them because of the election of a leader they did not care for. He became 
increasingly popular and increasingly important. However, he was soon driven into exile again. He was more of a political leader of the party, however, than a military leader, and was considered more pragmatic than some of the more militaristic leaders of Hamas. However, he was not at all against the 2023 attacks, and he fully endorsed them from exile in Qatar. Um, just today, uh, July 31st, 2024, he was attending the inauguration of the new president-elect of Iran from the Reform Party. And he was assassinated by the Israelis along with his guard. This is not a particularly unique occurrence. For all the talk of the West about condemning political violence, they condemn political violence against their number, not any other political group. From the whole history of the Cold War, if any leader speaks out or acts against imperialism, he's very likely to be murdered if he is from a third world country. A good example of that is Patrice Lumumba, who, for a suspicion of working with the Soviet Union, was assassinated along with much of his family. His body was dissolved in acid, and all, all that remained of him was his teeth. Eventually, uh, the family of Patrice Lumumba was able to receive the teeth with a heartfelt apology from the American government 50 years later in 2002. Oh, I'm so sorry we murdered the democratically elected leader of your country setting in motion a series of conflicts that would kill millions of people because we didn't want to hinder the unending profit of corporations. Uh, don't 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 read too much into that, you know. <laughs> well, I can imagine uh, that Ismail Haniyeh had felt a great deal of grief before his death because he wasn't the first member of his family targeted for murder by the Israeli regime. In fact, they sought out members of his family to murder. His brother, his 80-year-old sister, his grandchildren, his children. It was his nephews. It was open season on any relative of this man, irrespective of any particular crime, extrajudicial murder of people just for being related to a political enemy. He, one must imagine, felt substantial grief at his family being picked off, you know, one by one for his brave political stance against imperialism. But he still represented, a, like, you know, a brave face. He says, how can I, just one leader, you know, you know, say that my suffering is more than the suffering of Palestinian people. Palestinian people have all lost families to the IDF and to Shin Bet and to extrajudicial murder by the Israeli regime. I'm not special. <laughs> and his death is not special. He's one more casualty in a genocidal campaign against Palestinians carried out by the Israeli regime and in an attempt to provoke greater response from Iran because it's not a superficial detail that this leader was assassinated in Tehran, the capital of Iran, during the inauguration of their new president. One of the most provocative acts imaginable in, in politics. Like, let's, let's imagine if, you know the freaking Queen of England was assassinated by the IRA during the inauguration of an American president. Uh, that's kind of the idea we, we could get from that. Well, you know, 
we'll see what the new president of Iran reacts to this tremendous provocation. Obviously, the Israeli regime intends to provoke a reaction so that they can claim that there was an unprovoked attack by Iran against them. It's a sort of double-think attitude that fascist regimes have always carried out, always accepted throughout history, where they celebrate their murder and then pretend that they didn't murder someone after it happened when the inevitable response comes. We just re must remember that Israel is a fascist state carrying out genocide against Palestinians, and it must end. That isn't to say that the Jewish people must end. The Jewish people will be preserved and not end because Israel will end. And hopefully, and some might say inshallah, some might say God willing, God's willing, whatever you say, or hopefully this will be not just in our lifetime, but in the course of a few years, that the international community will put an end to this festering cancer that is the Zionist state. Bye.